Hi, this is your host, Apil Bharatia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again, Pavel Despot, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Akamai. And today we are going to talk about, you know, a big storm in the teacup, which is Amazon Prime, where they released the blog about um, how moving to monolith was saving them a lot of, you know, costs versus using serverless. Uh, but the thing is, there is a lot to read here. Uh, first of all, we should all uh, kind of appreciate uh the that amazon you know actually released that blog and as we were before this discussion you said this is what we need we need these discussions people will always pick and choose but this is most important thing which is to be transparent talk about technology in the terms of technology so if i asked you when you saw this story what was what is your you know analysis what is going on there yeah i, I agree very much it's it was it was a bigger topic in security a few years ago and we had these issue of hey we should share you know, we should share breaches. We should share this information. Uh, it is certainly could be sensitive, but I, I definitely applaud anyone who shares kind of the evolution because there's lessons to be learned. And uh, aside from the memes that kind of came along with it, there are things to learn for all of us. We've all kind of been in that position where, as they described in the beginning, you started with this service and then all of a sudden you're asked to, oh, do it for... X, Y, Z times greater scale. So there's a, there are lessons in here. Um, my first reaction was just that, uh, you know, it was a kind of a typical situation where they had, I'm guessing, I don't know, this nice internal tool that was really helpful. And somebody said, hey, that's a great tool. We should do that for everything. And then you have this project in your hand and you're probably left with this big architectural decision. Again, speculating, but... Um, I think we all probably have seen that kind of scenario play out. And actually, when I look at it, I, I felt that this is the actual scientific method. You try things, you know, you implement them. And when that if they don't work, you, you don't just stick to it just for the sake of, hey, that's where we are doing. You just choose the right right tool, right approach for the right use case. And this use case is also not a generic use case. It's, you know, specific to their Amazon Prime, the delivery, you know, how to send content, uh, optimize it, who is doing what. So it's also a bit different than a lot of use cases where microservices, serverless makes a lot of sense. Even a lot of things Amazon does, they are still using it, they'll continue to use. It's once again, it goes down to right approach, right tool for the right job. So, so talk a bit about once again, this is specific use case where they saw this value in monolith versus uh, you know serverless to your point media in particular is a bit of an edge case for for a lot of things uh, just given the volume given the distribution given the real-time nature of it right we don't see a lot of it but when we're watching live event sports there is a lot speaking from a company that dabbles in CDN uh, a lot that has to happen for the bits from that camera to make it to our phones in you know five ten seconds. Uh, that's usually a lot of the hand waving latency that we see. So there, this is a very specialized use case. Now, if we were to take a look at this particular example and, and see what lessons we can draw, media because it's special. One of the things that makes it specialized is the volume. One of the things that makes it specialized is how quickly you need to react, especially if this is a, a real time stream. Uh, in their case, it was an analysis workflow, so that's something you don't want to really delay. Right? You don't want to batch it out and have it be done hours later. So if we look at those aspects of a media workflow, and then we look in hindsight, hey, was you know was this the right choice? Well, that's where you kind of see you, you kind of see again in hindsight why we saw some of those challenges happening. First of all, they already talked about in the article how they were already doing uh, a few slick things to minimize the amount of data, right? So before they even went at the problem of analysis, they were really trying to minimize their input data set to fit it within the constructs of, in this case, step functions, right, and, and serverless. Um, and then as that scaled, of course, that just became bigger and bigger. So what stood out to me is, yeah, the start and it was perfect, but as you stream out to thousands of streams, which, you know, largely high def streams these days are in the area of three to four to five plus megabits. You really had a big compute problem. And like they said, you saw that bumping up against the limits and starting to do interesting things with transfers to S3s to keep in those limits. But I guess the lesson to maybe take away is if all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're breaking that torque wrench you're working on, maybe you need a bigger torque wrench or, 
or some other kind of tool in general uh, if you keep breaking it. Talk a bit about, uh, with once again, bigger wrench or totally different tool? The bigger wrench piece was kind of what they did, right? If you call, if you, if you extend the analogy to the monolith, instead of parsing it out, and just like with any architectural pattern, right, there are places where it can use and you can turn up the dial on, on uh, not distribution, decomposition as much as you like, and you can turn it down. The, the idea is for cloud, yeah, of course, cloud is a perfect spot. Cloud, generally what we call cloud regions and availability zones have a, a ton of resources, right? We can have specialized GPUs, we can have, which in this use case, potentially maybe more cost efficient, but there's a lot of computing power and a lot of computing specialization that again, for this use case makes perfect sense. And that's where the cloud is. The other side of things on where serverless, you know, should be used. And again, wasn't applicable in, in this part of the use case, but serverless, if you think about it, stateless, relatively small, right? And not entirely stateless, right? There's distributed KVs, but you're not, ch you're not, you're not building an AI model in serverless or probably shouldn't be, or else maybe you'll see something like this. Um, what it, it's good for is low latency, quick response, being distributed, not decomposed, distributed, so you can put it in a bunch of different places, it being the compute workload. Um, if you're gonna centralize it, great, use serverless for like admin jobs, right? Where you're not, we don't need to chunk up a bunch of data, but that's kind of the opposite. Cloud is, is still great and will continue to be great for these massive workloads, but the quick, quick response, quick instantiation, uh, you know, small workloads, very distributed. That's where serverless still has a place to play. I think in this case, looking back, a lot of those attributes weren't there, so it didn't make the best sense. This is also a very good uh, kind of point of discussion, you know, that whenever new technologies come up, companies get kind of you know excited about it, hype cycle, you know, hey, yes, we should embrace this, we should embrace that. But this brings us to a very important point, which is, and we discussed this last time also when we were discussing about cost and other things was also, don't start with the technology that in the market, it start with what you're trying to do and then what is the right approach to solve that problem. This is once again, a very good lesson for that also. Uh, I definitely think the way to look at it is look at your application. So first of all, absolutely agreed on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, Number one, that should always be your guiding star. Because if you're not sure, you're not really, you don't know when you got there and you don't know where there is. So it goes without saying. But in terms of things to think about of where workload placement is, do think about how much capacity you'll need. Not right now, right? And I know it's to your point, whether it's a new technology or a new product, everyone's always excited to get that MVP out. Right. Hey, look what we prototyped. Look how quickly we got it out. Look at all the awesome features, especially today. Right. There's a lot of components that you can bring together and get something extremely, especially when you have talented folks, you get extremely compelling out. That is great. And you should do that. There is kind of a, a point where you need to now roll into production and the way you architected things should be a little bit different. If you opted for easy, like, OK, yeah, I'm managing my logs and my observability with functions, let's say. Great. But keep in mind that the architecture you start with, and I know this is hard because it hardly ever changes. And the worst, hardest thing is these folks did. Again, applause to them. They changed it. Um, but keep in mind that you will probably have to change it, especially if you're successful. Right. And again, perfect example in this case, people started using it. Oh, all right. Yeah, we didn't expect that. Right. No, not this many. So um, that's number one. And then two, number two, think about Think about what we have to think about today is not just regions, but also distribution. I think that we have another dimension in terms of our architecture. Before we had to think about, all right, do I want it in this region or you know, X, Y, Z regions? Now it's how much do I want to distribute it? Meaning, is there part of my workload that I need to be in hundreds of regions? That's not going to be 90% of your app, right? Um, for those, right, those workloads, that's when you use your serverless, that's when you think about it that way. But just do realize that now all of a sudden there is this other dimension to make our lives a lot e easier. Uh, that it's not just choose your provider, but 
choose how distributed you want to be, right? And then you get into the whole edge world of, do I want to go with like a wavelength type of deployment because I need that for my, you know, manufacturing or a hyperscaler edge, like edge workers and such. So um, think about that dimension as well. One of the biggest lessons that we have learned is that companies also need to be more transparent that even if they are making these kind of changes, which actually goes against their own, you know, uh, philosophy or, you know, the whole market, they should be transparent. They should be brave enough to come up and talk about it. That could be also a very good lesson. What do you have to say about that? Absolutely agreed. I think these days, so number one, I don't think there's any any shame. Decisions are made in the context. We've all been in those meetings, whether it's architectural, whatever. We are in the situation, most people, reasonable people in that very meeting that I'm sure you're all thinking of as I'm saying this, you go, all right, I may not have agreed with it, but there were there was context within that. Um, even if there wasn't, keep in mind that a, a technology decision may have been made because there wasn't an option, a, a reasonable option there. So the idea that we should be afraid of going, hey, we have to rip this out, shouldn't be scary unless you don't have a reason for it. Going back to, oh, I want to try this new technology. That's not a reason. I want to rip this out and we have to go to a monolith because this is how we get the next level of scale that we now need to address. Perfectly reasonable. Um, hey, I heard this other technology is really cool and I want it on my resume. That should never pass a sniff test of any like architecture or IT, IT team, right? So make changes, don't be afraid of them. If they're made for the right reason, they will benefit despite the short-term pain. And, and the transparency is, is huge. Robert, thank you so much for you know, uh, you know joining me at such a short notice and discuss this topic today. And as usual, I'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you.